to reclaim you. Laura, we're season two. I thought it'd be kind of fun to check in with everyone as we're, you know, rolling out season two. Everybody's coming back after a nice month break from recording and the podcast to revisit this year in this season of life, because last year was a long time ago. What does reclaim you mean to you these days? When we talk about like reclaiming ourselves, some people get a little like, I don't know if I want that. So mm. <laughs> like, I don't. And, and so what I look at it is, is it's reclamation in the sense of reclaiming the possibility of who you can and always could be, but, but that which got in the way, you know, whether, whatever the trauma was, whatever the experience were, were so that when we are taking the steps into therapy, you know, when we're at this impasse where it's like, there's this huge part of me that keeps making the same mistakes over and over again, or keeps, you know, struggling in the same way, or just can't seem to move past something in my life. And then, you know, another part of you that's like, we, we have to do some of that, right? Like mm -hmm. we can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, and there are various ways that we work with it. And we don't always have to like go piece by piece and bit by bit either with everything. But the practice of coming to therapy even can be healing, right? It's just mm -hmm. the practice of sitting in the room with someone and showing up for yourself and learning to be safe and starting to be vulnerable. And sometimes it's three steps forward and a million steps back. But over time, right, that like the arc is leading toward that healing and that, that um, integration of self into this newly transformed self. So. Mm -hmm. You know, when I talk about the reclamation of self, it really is, um, it is that integrated, transformed self that I think we are reclaiming as we should have always had access to it, but which, for which life got in the way. Beautifully put. Thanks. So it feels appropriate, given what you just said, in terms of like being in relationship with yourself and being in relationship with other people, with your therapist, goes right in line with what we're talking about today. And that's mm -hmm. being in relationship with folks who have experienced trauma in their lives mm -hmm. and how to do so in a way that is supportive for you and for your person. Yeah. And it can be tricky because trauma is so tricky and so tough and can really impact relationships with self, with others so significantly and different people respond to trauma in different ways so you know a relationship with one person who has a significant trauma past might look different than a relationship with another person mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that's what we're diving into today where should we start i always like to start i think with safety mm -hmm. being in relationship i would say by and large is an unsafe place for folks who have experienced trauma it can be unsafe in different ways right so like we often see folks who are isolated they pull away they don't get close right they don't rely on anyone like i'm independent like if you think about you know those folks that you know or maybe perhaps you who like you don't ask for help you know and and if we dig into that why aren't you asking for help well because probably people have disappointed you in the past and haven't come through and so you rely solely on yourself so there can be this like pull away this like hyper vigilant independence this isolation and loneliness just to get to know someone can be difficult mm -hmm. and if we push too hard the odds are that person's just going to close up more the opposite of that which also happens is the person who is like you know oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm needy, needy, needy. I need, 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 like, uh, save me, save me, save me, right? Like, that can happen as well, in which case our tendency sometimes is to be like, ah, go away, right? Like, mm -hmm. which is the very thing that their behavior is responding to from the past, mm -hmm. right? Like, somehow they were abandoned in some way, emotionally, physically, what have you. And so us pulling away like that only further causes the same stress that then leads to the same behaviors. So like, how do we create safety for this person? You know, first of all, if someone who is very like isolated decides to try and step into a relationship with someone in whatever way that looks right, that's sacred. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. That's huge. 
and I, yeah, I don't think we can, I don't think we can overemphasize like how important it is for us to honor that, you know, and that this is a huge decision. They're making themselves vulnerable. And so it's really important that we, we treat this as something that's, you know, fragile, right? Not that they're fragile, right? Mm -hmm. They've survived. Yes. Like, yes. I mean, people who've had trauma, I, like I say this to my clients all the time, like the, the the shit you've had to go through, like, holy shit, like you are a survivor, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we think, oh, they're weak, they're blah, 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 blah. But no, mm -hmm. no. All of these behaviors are because like they've had to survive. And so, you know, to really consider like what is safe, like, and, and it, it's gentle, right? Like I think about, you know, I, I don't want to equate human beings to animals, although we are animals, like at, at our heart. But like I've done a lot of work with rescued dogs and cats, and like they come with trauma. And I learned pretty quickly that if I went in too hard, too fast, that I got bit. <laughs> like mm -hmm. right, like mm -hmm. yeah, uh, it was not helpful. Or they ran away, mm -hmm. like I literally ran away, and I, you know, I had to chase after them. Versus like sitting and i think parker palmer says it best he says like we sit quietly and we wait for the shy soul to show up mm. this is a very 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 wounded scared soul who is beginning to step out and so how do we just hold that very gently and compassionately and allow them to be as they need to be without trying to force them to be something else i think that so often comes up in relationships, doesn't it? Like we, we want the person to change and we spend all of our energy trying to get them to change. And in doing so, often it just creates more of a divide. And certainly if you're sending the message to someone who is, is in a relationship who has a lot of trauma that they need to change, I mean, that's further exacerbating a shame and blame. Like this, this deep sense of like, I'm not worthy. Mm -hmm. No one loves me. You know, um, so safety is so important and you learn that, right? Like, it's like a dance. Like mm -hmm. some of my clients, it takes years for us to find a way to be safe because of the extent of their trauma, right? Mm -hmm. Really how I, as a therapist, think about it. And I'll say this probably as a friend too, is like to just keep showing up and holding space. Mm -hmm. And here we are. And however you are here today is is perfectly okay. It was people in my life who allowed me to be as I was without trying to change me and just loved me despite all of the ways that I was acting out that provided those sort of steps toward my own healing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's creating safety for people. That's what's so important. Without safety, we can't really move anywhere else. Yeah. And it's hard, right? Because for lots of folks who have experienced trauma, the lack of safety is what feels normal and maybe safe, right? So it feels so True. complicated because yeah. we want to create and be with people in a different way that really is like secure safety and genuine safety. But when someone's used to just feeling like the world is on fire and relationships are dangerous and having to protect themselves and put up walls, that feels super safe. So showing up in a different way can create so much tension. Yes. Yes. So it takes time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, like, this is why we encounter people. And you, you know those people who just really, you meet them and you're like, oh my gosh, like, whoa. Like, there's just a lot of, like, anger or a lot mm -hmm. of or a lot of this. And it, it literally are putting up this very protective shield of selves because they've been so hurt and wounded. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, like that's going to be continue to be the behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Like until there's enough consistency, like, and that, like I said, I take forever, but you're right. You're right. Like that feels safe to them. Mm -hmm. And so when we're like, you don't need to be that way anymore, the odds are the behavior is going to go up before mm -hmm. it starts to settle. Um, so I think that's a really excellent point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then caring for yourself as the person who's in relationship with someone who's experienced a lot of shit in their lives, taking care of yourself and understanding your own needs feels equally as, as important, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Seeking the support that you need is one of the things that I was thinking about. Like there are great places you know, for those of us who are in relationships with folks who are struggling to seek support, both 
like as a friend and family member with other friends and family members in some sort of support group setting or by like if this is a someone we're close to like having a therapy session with them and their therapist if that's where they're at and they feel safe with that and they ask for that or seeing our own therapist and and working through that with them like because inevitably it's going to trigger things in us you know regardless of what our past is and and so how do i navigate that on my own in a safe place for me where it's not I'm not just like getting myself into a situation where I'm triggering this person in my life and then they're triggering me and this is all that we do. And, and then, you know, no one wants to live like that. Right. Right. right? And then we both feel really crappy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, seeking support, taking care of yourself, setting boundaries, but, and, and the person at first, when we set boundaries with them is not going to like that by and large, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's either going to further fuel, well, by and large, you're going to be like, oh, there you go again, right? Like someone else abandoning me, someone else doing this to me. So like it might, they might be angry. They might be, they might act out in ways like that, or they might just like cut off completely and isolate. And there's a whole host of ways they might become really dramatic about it. And how do we stand our ground in a way that is gentle and compassionate, asserting that this is what we, you know, this is what I need, but I'm not. I'm also not saying that it's because of you, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not blaming you because that's all they're hearing. And that that's tricky, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's an example of that? Let's try to think of an example to like play that, play that through a little bit of like knowing that folks who've experienced trauma in their lives, relationships are hard and they may get triggered and act out and things like that. And then being in a relationship or partnership or whatever it is with someone setting a boundary yeah, let's kind of like play through it if we can. Something that comes to mind to me, like, let's say I'm the the friend or I'm the family member, or I'm the the person in this, you know, in, who is sitting with this folk, you know, sitting with someone who has been traumatized um, and has a trauma history and something happens that's really hurtful to me. I have a right to assert myself and to say, you know, I really didn't appreciate that. So one way I could go is like, what the fuck? what is your problem? You know, screw you. Mm -hmm. Another way I could go is just cut off and not ever talk about it with them. I wouldn't suggest either of those ways are very helpful. Mm -hmm. A different way to go might be to instead, how can I detach myself a little bit from my stuff enough to be able to both assert myself effectively you know, and do so in a way that's not going to cause like further undue harm, if you mm -hmm. will. So what would it be instead to be like, Hey, so like, it seems like you're, it seems like you're really upset today. And I'm just wondering, like, what's going on? You know, is there something you need to talk about? Like, that's so foreign yeah. to so many people. They're mm -hmm. like, wait, wait, you're not going to like cancel me from your life? Like mm -hmm. what? Like I had situations where I, w I was so ashamed that I was like isolating. Mm -hmm. And what was super helpful is when someone, you know, the person with whom that something had happened would reach out and say, I'm just thinking of you and I hope you're mm -hmm. okay. And let's talk about this. Like when you're ready, that's not easy to do. Right. Right. It's, it's not. a skill, but that's where working that out on your own with a trusted other, with a therapist might be helpful. Yeah. But yeah. I always think about like, let's be curious instead of automatically going to this person was trying to hurt me. This person was trying to do this. Um, which tends to be our default, especially if we've been traumatized, mm -hmm. um, instead to be like, hmm, curious, like, it's really curious that that came up. How can I approach this with curiosity and compassion? Mm -hmm. And that presents a whole different way of being and doing for this person and can be amazingly healing over time. Yeah. Over time. Over time, right? Like not a one, not a one time. And you're healed. I was nice to you or compassionate with you, right? It's like no stepping outside of shame and blame over and over and over again can create just a even like a soft pathway for something different for people. Yeah, and the shifts are soft, and like sometimes like we see like we're feeling that like oh wow, and then they pull away. And I always think to myself and I'm thinking through the lens of a therapist but I think as well as a friend as a family member okay like there's a reason that they pulled away and I'm concerned for this person and for their health and well-being and so I want to check in on them mm -hmm. hey you know we've been missing you lately we haven't heard from you 
um, and we miss you. There's a reason you're in relationship with this person. I mean, like, if right. this is not someone you like and not someone like, okay, then maybe that's not meant to be a relationship that you're right. in. Right. You know, don't get caught in your own caretaking and needing to save the world. Right. That's a whole nother realm. Go see a therapist, mm-hmm. <laughs> but especially in families, you know, and I think that's, that, that sort of leads into like how we react and respond in other ways, which we can get into a little bit more, but I wanted to, yeah. to see if you had anything else to offer. Yeah, no, no. I, yeah, let's get into that. Let's get into that. So we work with trauma and eating disorders, disordered eating. And so we see behaviors that can be really scary. So certainly folks who are struggling with disordered eating behaviors who are in full, you know, just like the full throes of an eating disorder. I think those of us who are really close to them and love them most, it can be terrifying for us. Yeah. People who are self-harming can be terrifying. People who are talking about, you know, who have suicidal ideation are talking yeah. about, you know, harming themselves in that way. Again, terrifying. And our tendency when we're terrified is not to be like, okay, let's be curious about this. Uh, our tendency yeah. is to be like, oh my uh, God, I got to help them, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I right? want to fix it. I want to fix it. I want to fix it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a way to like, it's delicate, right? Like it's a dance. But when we, I love Janina Fisher, I think put it really well. She's like, you know, the promise of suicide, right? She put it that way, which at first you're like, what? What What the hell are you talking about? But when I talk to my clients, like, like if they're self-harming, um, if they're having suicidal ideation, that's passive, right? I mean, active suicidal ideation where they plan and all take action <laughs> and make sure they get, you know, make sure you're, you're getting that person professional help. Like mm-hmm. I'm not saying, This is not your job to like manage this. However, you know, what you can do is, is try and understand that oftentimes these types of behaviors and ways of thinking are places that feel safe for this person, but it's actually like a way to sort of like regulate and like stick it out. Self-harm is a way like self-harm has this way of this person, you know, or, or addiction. Like, I don't want to feel. I don't want to feel because feeling is painful. So what am I going to do to not feel? I'm going to numb out. Yeah. And I'm going to use drugs, alcohol, other things to numb out. Or I never feel. I'm always numb. I hate the fact that I'm so disconnected. I want to feel something. And so I might harm myself in order to feel something. And people can engage in both ways. And so to understand that, like, this is a, this is a person trying to figure out how to regulate their nervous system, how to find a sense of safety in what is a very unsafe existence. And rather than us responding with terror and further amping things up, which then tends to like cause them to feel like, again, I'm a terrible person. I hate myself. Like yeah. now I'm causing all this problem in my family. Like, you yeah. know, and I see the clients who are like, I'm so sorry I said that to you. Like, I shouldn't have done that to you. I'm like, yeah, as family members, as friends, you know, as a person in relationship, when we're hearing that type of language to try and stay calm as much as possible. And again, to, to understand that, you know, there are extremes that folks have had to go to, to survive. It doesn't, necessarily mean it's an escape right it's a way to find safety it doesn't mean that this is something that they intend to complete you know and i think it's still good then to say hey maybe it would be good for you to talk to someone yeah. and if you're really sometimes we just gotta freak out mm-hmm. and pull the sure. plug and like and then you know like it can be it's also we can repair like when we misstep or when there's like this backlash from us responding in some way, there is an opportunity to repair that relationship. And I think it's also understanding that it might take time, but repair is possible and healing is possible in the relationship, in ourselves. It takes a lot of patience and perseverance. Yeah. yeah. And that idea of, you know, I say just, but it's not just that the idea of just staying, right? Just staying and holding the care and the concern And even like wanting desperately to like fix it or make someone feel better and make it go away. If it was that easy, right, we would all, you know, fix things and it's not that easy. So it's that staying and just being present and available as much as is in your capacity, right? Like taking breaks, taking care of yourself. But when someone's deeply, deeply suffering, there's not a lot of fixing that can happen. There is a lot of co-regulation and availability 
and holding space, not advice giving, any of those things that can really move the needle for people just to feel heard, you know, and seen. Yeah, by trying to take away their pain, like if I'm trying to fix it and trying to make it go away, in fact, I'm invalidating in a lot of ways. What's going? It can it can feel really dismissive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is someone who is is suffering, and this is the way that they're communicating that to you. Mm-hmm. And so, how do, how do we learn to sit with others in their suffering without trying to uh, take it away? You know. Mm-hmm. And maybe that invites us into our own understanding of our relationship with suffering, grief, pain. How do we feel with that, generally speaking? Are we always trying to make it go away? Might there be a learning there for us? Oftentimes, a person, like some of the most difficult people in our lives, you know, a wise, wise friend of mine once said this to me, and and it, it just echoes that sometimes the most difficult people in our lives, they are put there, they're teachers, you know, that we can learn as much as we can we can learn about ourselves and 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 do our own sort of journey of, of growth and healing as we're in relationship with another person who might be challenging at mm-hmm. times to be in a relationship with for us not intentionally what is it to look at someone like if i look at this person as a teacher how might i shift my perspective and treat them differently mm-hmm. and myself differently right and myself, yeah, yeah. You know, if I if I look at just so you know, a, as it is, is you know, if I look at this as not someone who is um, being maliciously, you know, angry or whatever, but a person who is literally terrified and fighting for their life, which is often what's going on, mm-hmm. even though everything might seem fine in their life, yeah. they're living somewhere else. Yeah. If that's the case, then how do we create that? calm, centered space to just let them be as they need to be. Mm-hmm. And eventually, you know, that co-regulation, as you said, like will start to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard. It's so hard to be in relationship with people who are suffering. Cause like we said, you don't want to see the people you love and care about suffering so deeply mm-hmm. and feeling so kind of like helpless and powerless so, to help them change it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's really, it is sad that we live in a world where people have endured such terrible things, but it's also, for me, hopeful that we live in a world where healing is possible. Like harm that was created by a relationship, healing is also possible. And often, it, I mean, that's the way. Like we heal in relationship as much as we've been harmed by relationships. Like mm-hmm. That's where the turn, right? That's yeah. where the transformation occurs. Like yeah. this thing that used to be so scary now becomes the thing that becomes safe and healing. Mm-hmm. That's transformation. That's for sure. Yeah. With time. With time. Attention. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't do it on our own. I mean, mm-hmm. none of us can. Yeah. No, of course. Because, yeah, because a relationship is the thing. Relationship is the thing. Anything else you can think of? No, as I, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a bit about this, you know, for me, it was the three S's that really mm-hmm. came to mind, safety, space, seek support, and just, you know, being mindful of your own triggers, learning what those are. Uh, and, you know, if, if that's coming up for you, thinking about like, what would be healthy for me in this situation? Like, what's the best, what's the best way for me to be present to this person while I'm also attending myself, which we talked about. So yeah, but safety, space, seek support. It doesn't always have to be heavy either, mm-hmm. right? Like, hey, there's a way to balance like sitting with creating space and also like living life. Like, let's go and do this thing together. That would be really great. And it might help like to have a person who starts to like show up for you and help you to sort of step out of the house, step out of the the cave that we often and all the walls, you know, that it's okay as well. Just go have some fun. I mean, mm-hmm. let's go get some ice cream. Mm-hmm. Oh, you don't want to go out? So rather than me being like, you need to get out of the house and start to nag you and then you feel awful and you're shutting down more instead of being like, well, why don't I bring ice cream to you? Think outside the box. Mm-hmm. There's always a third way and a fourth and a fifth. I mean, there's infinite ways right. if we're willing to start to see more broadly. So say you're at three S's again. So how to be in relationship with someone who's experienced trauma. Safety, creating a space that is safe for them and also for you. Space. You know, not only creating that space, but also sometimes less space for 
processing for people to sort of get their bearings. It takes time. And then seeking support for yourself, for them, for others who might be, you know, impacted. Safety space. Support. Love those. Awesome. I'm all about those things to try and remember. Uh-huh. Yeah, to make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more complicated than three S's. That's but for sure. Three S's, <laughs> three S's are always you. like... Yeah. Pull yeah. you back into something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like the big rocks, right? Like worry about your big rocks. Anything you want to add before we wrap up? We're here for you. Right. And there's other great folks out there that are here for you. You know, if, if you're looking for assistance, looking for trauma informed folks, folks who are trained and understand this, I think is really important. And that's not to say that other therapists can't be helpful. They absolutely can be. But when we're dealing, especially with like some significant complex trauma, it might be helpful to to sit with someone who can offer that perspective. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, we're here for you and you don't have to be alone in this. No matter who you are in the relationship, you, you don't have to be alone. So yeah, mm-hmm. give us a holler, give us a shout. Well, thank you so much. and. Next week, Abby will be here giving a little tool. She wants to share a little tool with everyone. Do a lot of talking. So this will be a little concrete and something that you can hopefully use in your everyday. So that's coming next week. And thank you, Laura. And until then, take good care.